Anybody know what song that was? No. You don't know? I thought somebody would know. Like a river glorious. Yeah, so good. <laughs> like a river glorious, right? Like a river glorious. Yeah, so I know sometimes it's hard to tell. I, I forgot, but I remember I was thinking when I play these songs that sometimes it's time to pick it up with just piano music. Okay, today we're going to be in Revelation 21, and we're actually going to go over more than just one verse. I mean, the last couple of weeks we just did the one verse, right? Today we're going to do quite a few verses. I think it's what, 9 to 21? Is that 12 verses, 13 verses, somewhere on there? Now, whenever the Bible is taught, shouldn't it convict our hearts and our minds? It really should. It does mine when I studied. I, it's kind of like, Holy Spirit, you're working on my heart, you're working on my mind. I'm not the way I should be, and I'm, i got a ways to go. But hey, if I say something today that's a little bit rough, and it convicts you, realize I'm doing my job. You know, give me a pay raise, right? <laughs> but anyways, that's the truth. God's word should work on our hearts and our minds. It should, it should try to conform us. You know, we're like clay. And you take that clay and you squeeze it and you move it around and shape it the way you should. It's going to hurt a little bit, right? And that's so, as we study this today, I hope you understand it. Now, here's the thing. I have to confess to you. When I studied these verses here, I thought, this is not going to be real interesting to everybody because, you know, what it's about, it's about dimensions, it's about material, it's about colors, and I think, well, maybe Keller would be interested because he's mechanical engineering, or somebody that's in construction would be interested in this, but who's going to be interested in studying about dimensions, materials, and colors, right? Well, as I studied this, I got pretty excited because this really is pretty cool when you dig into this. There's a lot of good information here. So we're going to cover Revelation 21, verse 9 through 21. And I titled this, Heaven on Earth. We look forward to that day of having heaven on earth, right? So in our study, the book of the Revelation, we've reached that time that describes the new heaven and the new earth. I mean, we, we kind of bent over all this stuff that people don't really like to hear about previously, about the tribulation and so on, and now we're at this part where we're talking about the new heaven and new earth. But I'll tell you what, if you don't study that first part first, you're not going to get the full understanding of this, the new heaven and the new earth. Okay, because, hey, this earth we're living in right now is falling apart. It really is. And so we really need to pray for this election. But, hey, we need to pray for each other and that we'll attract the right people to this church and this church will grow because people need the Lord. They really do. They need to know about Christ. They need to know this truth. Um, as sure as we're standing here today, if you have at some time in your life had trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you will one day open your eyes to an eternal heaven and a loving Savior. You will. If you trust that Christ as Savior, He's got you in His hand, as John 10, chapter 10, verse 28 29 tells you. You can't get out. Nobody can get you out. You're saved for all eternity. You're secure. So I hope you understand that. So if you've trusted Him, um, you've got a bright, beautiful, wonderful future. And we're going to touch, just touch on this today because how can I describe heaven to you, right? What a day of rejoicing that will be. I cannot help but I think of that verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. And that verse, Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 2, 9. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Is that true? I mean, you think about that? We can't comprehend what we have here. So today we're going to see the tip of the iceberg, right? We're just going to kind of talk a little bit about heaven today. But you know what? There's so much more for us to see. And this should just wet your um, tongue a little bit to go, hey, I can't wait. This is going to be amazing. If I was taken to heaven right now, I would never have comprehended. I really couldn't. It's beyond amazing. And that's what Paul said. So he could not explain it to everybody. And here John does the best he can to explain it to us. So um, if you're going to take notes today, I'm going to give some references that are very important, very relevant. Or just go ahead and listen if you want. I'll have most of the verses on the screen, except for in Revelation 21. We're going to look at the verses in the Bible, and I'll be reading from the King James Version. So let's start off with Revelation chapter 21, verse 9. So verse 9 of chapter 21. There came on to be one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come here, I'll show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. See that there? One of the seven angels. Now these angels were used to pour out these vials. Remember they, the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, the bowl judgments. Jesus opened the seals as we learn in chapter 6. And these were all poured out in the world. All these judgments upon the earth dwellers that God's trying to get their attention, right? 
to kind of wake up. Hey, I, I created this world. I want you to understand that. And many of them shake their fist at them and rebel, and they don't change their mind about what they believe. But one of the seven angels came here to John and says, I'm going to show you this here as it says there in verse 9, um, the bride, the lamb's wife. Angels have different purposes, right? Um, and then one of the purposes here, we see in Hebrews 1.14, it tells us, are they not all ministering spirits, which is that a servant, sent forth to serve or minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Do you realize right now there could be angels around here? I'm serious, we don't see them, but you know, they're, they're ministering spirits. And we pray that God, you know, put a shield around us, build a, around us, you know, to protect us. And we should always be praying for that for our church. But I believe that as we pray, God will protect us. And there could be angels here around us right, right now. And they have different purposes. God uses these as servants. Remember this verse in Hebrews 13 too. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers. That means to be loved, to be kind, to be hospitable. For thereby some have entertained angels. Okay, unawares. We, didn't, we don't, didn't know it. Angels can become in human form. You know that? You know, they really can be. And, and sometimes we may not know it, but we should. it tells us that we have to be careful because not only does God see everything we do, you and I do, and knows everything about us, the Holy Spirit lives within us if you trust the Christ, but there's angels around here too. And so we have to be careful how we lived our lives, even behind closed doors, right? Don't we? So you can, it says here, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels. And you know that? That could possibly be, and that's something we should be aware of. So in Revelation 21, what I call Revelation 21c, which is the last half of that verse, it says this. The angel says to John, come here, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. The bride, as we know, is the church. We're the church. The church is everyone from Pentecost to the rapture, everybody in that area of 2,000 years so far that have trusted Christ as Savior makes up the church, okay? Before that, there was Old Testament saints. After that, in the tribulation, there's going to be tribulation saints. But this group right now from Pentecost, when Christ rose and went to heaven, and then to the rapture, is, we are called church-age saints. Everyone that's trusted Christ as Savior is a saint. We're, we make up the church, right? The bride of Christ, the Lamb's wife. Who's the Lamb? The Lamb's Jesus, right? So, it says in the first two verses of this chapter, which we studied a few weeks ago, it said this. John said, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So the bride of Christ is represented in this form as, as being a, a city coming down to Jerusalem. We call it the New Jerusalem. And so let's look at verse 10 and 11 of Revelation chapter 21. Verse 10 says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. You look at that, and I don't think we can compliment the beauty of this city. It says having the glory of God. I remember my dad would always say, he'd say, that's nothing to shake a stick at. Who's ever heard of that saying? Nothing to shake a stick at, right? I mean, what it means is don't trivialize it. Don't minimize it. I mean, this is pretty important. Don't be casual about God's glory. Don't be flippant about it because God's glory is something that is overwhelming and amazing and we'll be there in heaven with him. I remember what Paul said here in 1 Timothy Chapter 3, verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. That was Jesus. The, Bible, the New Testament tells us over and over again that Jesus was God. You know that, right? The Mormons are wrong, by the way. But Jesus was God. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up to glory. In God's presence is glory. I, back in the Old Testament, remember back in, um, when they went into the temple, uh, back in Second Chronicles, it said this, So the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. They could not be around that God's glory. Us in our mortal bodies, God's glory is just going to overwhelm us, isn't it? Um, we, we can't take it. We can't understand it. It's, it's more too much for us. 
But if we jump ahead a few verses in verse 23 of Revelation 21, it talks about this city. It says, And the city had no need of the sun, neither the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Isn't that amazing? The light in this new city, the new heaven, is going to be from God and the Lamb. I mean, think about that. God's glory, and we'll be there with it, because if you trust that Christ as Savior, you'll receive your immortal bodies, and you'll be there for all eternity in God's glory. I mean, it's a lot more than we could put our you know, finger on to think about how can I comprehend or understand this. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2.19, as I said, you know, you can't, we can't really understand this. But let's go ahead and look at verse 12 through 14 as we move through chapter 21. And verse 12 of chapter 21, and we'll read through verse 14, it says this. And this is talking about this new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven. And had a wall great and high, and had 12 gates, and had 12 ages. We're going to see the numbers 12 here as we go through this. And the names there written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel, on the east three gates, and the north three gates, and the south three gates, and the west three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. I mean, God designed this city. It is quite amazing. So look at here. It had 12 gates. And I'm going to talk about this number 12 here in just a minute. But at the gates we had 12 angels. Okay? And the name of the 12, then we see here, the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Um, is it getting a little warm for everybody? If you want to turn the air on, Chris, if it's a little too warm. But, but anyways, Ezekiel 48, verse 31 through 40, 34, gives you the list of these 12 tribes of Israel. And this is the list for the millennial kingdom when the new Jerusalem came down. So I think this is going to be the same ones that were written here, okay? The 12 tribes of Israel. And here's that list. All the way from Reuben, all the way through Asher. Uh, but there's one that's questionable here, and that's Dan. Remember when we studied uh, Revelation chapter 7, it talked about the 144,000 and all the Jewish tribes, and it didn't mention Dan. It had Manasseh in there um, instead, and I think that's because Dan had committed adultery and he was left out there. But I think in the New, uh, new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven, I think Dan's going to be there on this list because Ezekiel 48 says that. So um, these are the list of the, of the tribes that will be written there. So now let's look at the rest of this. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and it had in it there the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Matthew 10, verse 2 through 4, has these 12 apostles, disciples, and here's that list. Now, I changed this list from Matthew 10, verse 4, because the very last one would have been Judas. Do you think Judas' name's going to be written? I don't think so. I'd be very much surprised. I think Paul's going to be there. Now, Acts chapter 1 when they drew straws, they chose Matthias, right? As the disciple to replace Judas. Some people think it's Messiah. I, personally, I think it's Paul that's going to be in this list, okay? So I believe these are what's going to be written in the foundation and, and uh, around the city of Jer the New Jerusalem here. Um, I love what Abraham thought of this city when he thought of it back in 1,200 years B.C., which is, what, over 3,000 years ago? This is what Abraham said in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 10. For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Do you realize Abraham, 3,000 years ago, was looking for this city that we're talking about in the book of Revelation? I mean, isn't that amazing when you think about that? He was looking for that city, and he's written about it here in the Hall of Fame of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11. So let's talk about this number 12. In verse 12, interestingly in verse 12, it says 12 gates, 12 angels, 12 tribes, okay? Then in verse 14, it says 12 foundations, 12 apostles. Verse 16, it says 12,000 furlongs. I'll explain a furlong here in a little bit. And then verse 21, it said 12 pearls, okay? We haven't gotten there quite yet. But there's seven sets of 12 listed here in chapter 21. Now in verse 17, it says 144 cubits. You know 144, the square root is 12, right? Okay, so 12 times 12. But anyways... Is it that why God has uses is these numbers? If you look in the Bible, now some people get a little carried away with numbers, but I think there's a revel, relevancy to a lot of these numbers. And there's a man that wrote a book, he was from England, named Robert Johnston. He's a Bible teacher, and he explains all these numbers. I've got that book, and it's pretty good. And he explains number 12 as speaking of God's sovereignty, because he looked at all the verses where the number 12 is used. And in here, Revelation 21, 
that this government perfection over the new heaven and new earth, it's God's sovereignty over the new heaven and new earth. So it, this, this world's going to be ruled, run by God. He's going to be sovereign over the world, the new heaven and new earth. Not now. Right now he's over this world and he dictates and, and has things, controls things. But the truth is, he allows us to do what we, have, what we do, right? And he allows Satan to have this reign right now to do things that he does. Someday that's not going to be true. Someday... It's going to be God who's going to rule everything in heaven, and we're going to be there with him in his glory, and it'll be perfect, no more sin. So I think that's absolutely amazing. But I want to look at another verse in Hebrews chapter 11, and that's verse 13. You'll see it on the screen, and actually I'm going to look at verses 13 through 16 of Hebrews chapter 11. So it says this, these all died in faith. These are all the ones that are written in the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 11. And it, it really it includes all those believers that have died in the past, okay? And it says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises. They didn't receive the promises. You know, there's going to be a generation that's going to receive the promises that's going to be taken to heaven at the rapture of the church. It's going to be amazing. But everybody, the promises, I think, is about heaven and all that goes with it. And we'll see that in just a second. But these all died in faith not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. They had faith. And they were persuaded. Are we persuaded that what we see in this Bible is true? Are we? I hope we are. And embraced them. Have you embraced what this Bible tells you when you read it? Like, wow, this is God's word and it's true. And confess that they were strangers and pilgrims. You and I are pilgrims. Do you know that? We're just here for a short time. We're, we're going to be going to heaven. Our true home is in heaven. It's not on this earth. And so... I hope we're okay with that. I hope we realize that everything we do on this world is going to be gone someday except for what you do for Christ. And the truth is, when you get to heaven, is that's going to be your eternal home. So right now we're just pilgrims. But then in verse 14 it tells us this, For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. Isn't that cool? I mean, they weren't satisfied for what was on this earth. They were looking for something better. Uh, the new heaven and the new earth. Then verse 15 here of Hebrews 11 tells us, And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from where they came out, they might have had the opportunity to have returned. You know, the Israelites, when they came out of Egypt, right, and they rebelled and they fussed and they wanted to go back, and, but they're looking for a better country. That going back there would not have been the answer at all. So in verse 16, But now they desire a better country that is heavenly, Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. God has prepared for them a city, and you, the church, that city's prepared for you. And we'll see that in Ephesians chapter 2 in here in just a minute. But let me, let me live, give you something here. The word promise is used about 50 times in the Bible. That word, you can look it up. Most of the time it's talking about the promises for God's people. Um, eternal life, heaven, and so on. Our future in heaven. In fact, 1 John chapter 2, verse 25, and this is a good reference verse, 1 John 2, verse 25 says this, And this is the promise that he has promised us, even eternal life. Do you believe God's promises? This is the promise that he has promised us, even eternal life. He's promised you that. If God gives you a promise, are you going to believe it? Or are you going to still think, well, i got to earn my salvation or i got to keep myself saved? Many people believe that. And they're never, they're never confident that, hey, if I die, no matter what, I'm going to heaven. God promised us eternal life. And that's what 1 John 2.25 says. John that wrote the 1 John, 2 John, 3 John is the same John that wrote the Gospel of John, and the same John that wrote the book of Revelation. And so here, let me share this with you. God cannot lie. There's a verse in Titus chapter 1, verse 2, says God cannot lie. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, says God cannot lie. In the Old Testament, Numbers 23, verse 19, God cannot lie. It says it over and over again. 1 John chapter 5, verse 10, and this one, if you get a chance, look this up and read the verses around 1 John chapter 5, verse 10 through 13. Um, 1 John 5, verse 10, it says if you don't believe God's record, that he's given to you eternal life, you're calling God a liar. So if you're going around and saying, well, um, if I don't live my life right, then I'm not going to go to heaven, you're actually believing in good works. You're actually believing that you have to do something to keep yourself saved or to be saved. The truth is you have eternal life. He's given it to you. It's not dependent on you. He died on the cross to pay for how many sins? All sins. 1 John 2, 2. Sins of the whole world. Not just what some people will call chosen ones, but everybody he's died for to pay for all of their sins. And you know what? 
it tells us also, you know, we, we can live as we please, can't we? But we're going to pay the price. 1 John chapter 6, verse 12 says you can do whatever you want, but it's not expedient to do that. That's what Paul said in 1 John 6, 12. Um, I can do whatever I want, but it's not good if I do. Why? Because God will discipline his children because he loves his children. In uh, Revelation 3, is it Revelation 3.19, I think, when it talks about the church of Laodicea, it says God disciplines those he loves, and he loves us. So if you, you misbehave yourself, he will discipline you. But that discipline will never include hell because he's died for your, paid for your sins. And you don't have the wrath of God on you anymore like the world does. You actually have God's love, and he will take you to heaven. Um, 1 John 5.5 5 says that it gives an example. 1 John chapter 5, verse 5, and you should read that chapter sometime because it tells us about a person that rebelled against God, commits some bad sins, that God decided, I had enough of you, I'm taking you to heaven. Do you realize that? God can take a believer that is rebelling against him to a certain point and say, I'm going to take you to heaven because of what you're doing. Read 1 John 5, 5 if you don't believe me. That's true. But you're saved no matter what. You're saved because the blood of Christ washed away your sins. And I hope everybody understands that. This is one of the things that most people don't understand. They really don't. All these people that believe you can lose your salvation are calling God a liar. 1 John 5 verse 10. He doesn't lie. When he gives you eternal life, it means eternal life. It doesn't mean temporary probation until you sin or or have you really saved? Are you No, if you've placed your faith in Christ as Savior, you're safe for all eternity. You're secure. You're secure in Christ. God's foundation is once saved, always saved. People hate that. I mean, people will get mad. They'll look, Ugh, make faces at you, and you don't know what you're talking about. But that's what the doctrine of the Bible says, and that's what our church doctrine stands on here at Tippecanoe Bible Church. I believe when Jesus died on a cross, he died for all our sins, and he says, if you believe in me, you have everlasting life at that split second that you believe you have everlasting life. Be careful of who you listen to. Heaven is our home. You have a future home in heaven, and we're talking about that today. So let's go ahead and look a little more into this. Back in Ephesians, which talks about the church, and on the screen, I'm going to have Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 through 22, when it talks about the church, that talks about you. Okay? So it says here, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners. You're not. You're not strangers and foreigners anymore. But you're fellow citizens within the saints. The saints, the Old Testament saints. God melded the church in with the Old Testament saints in heaven. will be the, the same. And of the household of God. There is a distinction. The church is those between that period that I said you, the Old Testament saints, Old Testament saints, tribulation saints, tribulation saints. But now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God. Um, what's in the household of God? There's angels. Remember them four creatures of the beast? Here's this insert that I gave you. I copied this, and I think it's pretty good. But it says here, no mention of animals. Down at the, bottom, the front page at, near the bottom in the eternal ages. Just because it doesn't mention a animals, it doesn't mean there won't be animals in heaven. I don't think we can concretely say for sure. But here's what I do know. Revelation chapter 4 talks about them four beasts, right? They're in heaven. So I believe there probably will be animals in heaven. Now, I don't know if our own little pets will be in heaven. I don't know that. But I do know that there will be, I think there will be animals in heaven, as obviously them four creatures that are talked about in Revelation chapter 4, right? So it says here, the household of God. So all these will be included there. And then it goes on to say in the next verse, verse 20, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being a chief cornerstone. This cornerstone of a building determines a standard, how it's built and, and everything in, in relationship to that, and that's Jesus Christ. And here we see in Ephesians 2 that the church is being referred to as a metaphor of a building, right? I mean, we're, we're being talked about as a building. Now, you know this church, typical new Bible church, is not this here little storefront building, right? It's actually you. We're together as a church. We make up the church. Now there's the universal church, which means everybody that's been saved since Pentecost to the rapture, that's the universal church. But then God set up in each city local churches. You see that whole, all the way through the New Testament. Now there's good churches, there's bad churches, right? As we know. So here's the thing. But it says here, In whom all the building fitly framed together grows onto a holy temple in the Lord. And we need to be growing 
to a holy temple in the Lord, in whom also are built together a habitation or a home or a place to live of God through the Spirit. So the cool thing, if you study Ephesians chapter 2 and you compare it with Revelation chapter 21, we see that in heaven we're going to be one close-knit family, you know. I mean, I don't think we're going to be have our own little uh, cliques that, oh, we were in the church and you were in the Old Testament. I don't think so. I can't wait to meet Moses. I really do. He's one of my heroes. I can't wait to meet Noah. I can't wait to meet any of these guys, right? I mean, look at all the ones we studied about in the Old Testament, um, Ruth and so on. It'll be so cool to meet these people in heaven. Now, here's what's going to be a surprise. And I say this kind of sadly in a sense. Many of the people you think you're going to see in heaven, you may not see that you think we're Christians. Many of the people that you didn't think were Christians, you may end up seeing. Because we don't know who truly has trusted Christ as Savior, right? We can't tell that. We don't know that for sure. You can look at somebody's life, but there's plenty of people that are living wonderful lives that aren't even Christians. So it's not by your fruits that I can determine if you're saved or not. Now I can say, this person is pretty dedicated. He's a servant. I know he believes what he says he believes, but how do we know for sure, 100% for sure? Only really God knows. I, you know, that's what we have to go by. Now, if somebody gives a clear gospel and they explain it, then we can say, okay, I'm pretty sure that this guy is saved. But only God knows for sure, right? The truthfully. But the truth is, we will not know for 100% who's saved or not saved on this earth, will we? We really won't. It's, it, we get to heaven, we might be surprised a little bit. So anyways, let's look at verse 15 through 17 of Revelation chapter 21. And it tells us this, verse 15. And he that talked with me, this is the angel, he that talked with me had a golden reed. Notice he had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lies four square and the length is as large as the breadth or the width. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs, the length and the breadth and the height are equal. So you see here, and then let's verse 17. And he measured the wall thereof, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man that is of the angel. So let's kind of understand this. He has this golden reed to measure the city, the gates, and the wall. Now why is that? Because I think John was looking at this, and it was overwhelming. But God says, hey, this angel is going to measure this for you. So you kind of have an idea, the enormous size of this, and what, it, what it's all about. So this angel measured this city. And so we see the golden reed there. But then it says in verse 16, the city lies four square. Length is as large as the width. Okay, so it's, it's square, right? We see that there. But then in verse 16, we also see he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Now, a furlong is about an eighth of a mile. But I'll, I'll, I'll go through and explain this here in just a minute. And the length and the breadth or the width and the height of it are equal. Okay, so length, width, and height. That's a cube, isn't it? Isn't that cool? And so then in verse 17, it also says, um, he measured the wall 144 cubits. Then it says, according to the measure of man, that is of the angel. So this angel measured this city, but he measured it so that John would understand it, okay? According to a measure of a man, because the units that man would understand. So he did that for us. And so furlong is about an eighth of a mile, which is somewhere around 660 feet. Now, the exact measurements back in them days were not perfect. Some look at this as 582 feet, maybe as a furlong, okay, differently. A cubit was about 18 inches, and a cubit was typically from your elbow to your end of your fingers, okay? Not always perfect either, right? So, a cubit's 18 inches, a furlong's about an eighth of a mile. So 12,000 furlongs would be anywhere from 1,400 miles to 1,500 miles, okay? And 140 cubits would be equal to 216 feet, so it would be about three-fourths of a football field, okay? So here we see that these dimensions, what the sizes are. So let me, a picture is what, you look at that and you say, yeah, this is, we can't, can't comprehend. What about a picture? Let's look at a picture of this, okay? So we'll see that next. When we say a city is a 1,500-mile cube, can you really understand it? Can you comprehend that? That's pretty good size. Compared to the United States, this is what it would look like. About half the United States. That's how big this city's gonna be. Now, that's just looking at the width and the length, right? Let's look at the dimension of the um, height of it, and we'd see it's like a cube. That's gonna be over New Jerusalem. That's gonna be over Jerusalem, actually. So, but I think showing it in a reference to the United States, I think you and I can get a kind of an idea of this. Um, here's what somebody said, 
and I kind of confirmed this also, but if one-fourth of this cube was used for people to live in, they could easily fit 20 billion people in one-fourth of it. That's amazing. Now, I'll talk about how many people I think really are, could possibly be in heaven, and this is just my conjecture, because from what I know from people understanding the true, clear gospel. But as you know, a mile is 5,280 uh, 5, feet, so uh, 1,500 miles would be 8 million feet. Now, if you look at the square feet here, we're looking at 63 trillion square feet, approximately, okay? Not exactly. 60 trillion square feet. So if you take... Um, 20 billion people and you try to fit them into this, each person would have a living space of about 3,000 square feet. 20, million, 20 billion people. Uh, the house I live in is what, about 1,500, so it's about half that. And so that's pretty, that's a lot. Now is there truly going to be 20 billion people? I don't know if there's that many people ever been on this earth since creation of 4,000 BC to now 6,000 years. I would say a lot less than that probably if you look at it and calculate it out. Now guys like Henry Morris, I know I've calculated this out, but and I, you look at today, you don't hear too many people clear a clear gospel. I mean, it's kind of messed up and confused because they believe there's you have to either have good works to be saved or you have to prove you're saved by having good works. Both of these are incorrect. The truth is, I know I'm saved for one reason, because the Bible tells me if I believe in Jesus Christ, I have everlasting life. Boy, if I had to go by how I lived, I would be in, living in questioning myself all the time, and I'm thankful for that. Now, should we live a good life? Yes, we better live a good life, because there's a chance God would discipline his children. Like, when you have children, if they run out in the street and they start playing in the street, you're going to bring them in, and you're going to, you know, you may warm up the rear end a little bit. No, I shouldn't say that, because nowadays you can't say that. It's, it's a bad thing, because, but anyways, you know, you may, you may discipline, you may put them in temporary probation, you can't go play out in the street anymore. God does the same to us. If we rebel against him, he will discipline you. And he will, because if we're not in his will and we're not willing to serve and love him and we want to live like the world, you know, he's going to discipline you. And like I said, he may even take you to home early, like I talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. And I know a case where I believe this happened to a guy, and it's, it really is kind of sad. I won't cover that right now. But here's the thing. Would this cube cause the earth's rotation to be unstable? Well, of course it would. If you're an atheist, right? I have no problem with this because God created the scientific laws. There will be no sun, there will be no moon, yet we'll have light. God can control everything he wants to control. So if somebody wants to laugh about this and say, oh, that's going to throw the whole world off kilter when it tries to rotate, I have no problem with that at all. Uh, God, God can control all this and make it work. Now remember back in Genesis chapter 11, remember our good friend Nimrod? which we use that name as a derogatory term today, you Nimrod. But remember Nimrod back in Genesis chapter 11? It says in verse 4 that he was trying to build the Tower of Babel to reach heaven. And you think of what he was trying to do compared to this. Pretty puny, right? Mankind thinks they can do all this stuff. And we get so amazed at mankind today, especially with computers, with this AI, and all the things we have as far as vehicles and airplanes and cars. My son has one of these new Teslas, okay? And he, he, he parks it in a parking garage. He works over at a, for the city of Lafayette. He says he can go to the garage and he can call his car from his phone and his car will back up and come to him. And it does it safely because it can detect it. It has all these sensors, anything around it for safety. Now, they won't allow you to do that in the streets yet, okay? It'd be kind of weird seeing a car going on the street with, with nobody in it. But anyways, we get amazed at this stuff. But that's puny. That's like the Tower of Babel compared, you know, with Nimrod to compare to what God can do. It's going to blow us away when we see this. It's going to be absolutely amazing. So let's look at these last four verses of 18 through 21. Revelation 21, verse 18. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished or decorated with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardis, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoporus, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth and amethyst. Okay, would you like to come up here and read these words? <laughs> this is a challenge. But anyways, verse 21. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was a one pearl, 
And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. Isn't, you think about that, how can you even bring that in your mind to understand it? The gates were made of the same type of material as pearls. Gold was so pure it was transparent. That is amazing. That is crazy. Back in the Old Testament, uh, once a year the, the, he, uh, the priest would go in, into the temple or the Holy of Holies, right? It says in Hebrews 9, verse 6 through 7, because they... We, people could not always be in the presence of God, according to the, you know, what we see in the Old Testament. So in Hebrews 9, verse 6 through 7, it tells us, Now when these things were ordained, the priest always went into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God, but into the second went the high priest alone once a year, and not without blood. He had to have a blood sacrifice when he went into the Holy of Holies, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the sins of the people. This is a temporary covering. That's why it's called Yom Kippur, for, for the people until Jesus Christ came and, and completed it on the cross of Calvary. This is what they did. But you know, you see here, if somebody else were to go into that Holy of Holies, they would be killed. If not, God didn't kill them immediately. They'd be stoned to death. They couldn't do it. But you and I will be able to live in God's presence. We don't have that fear. The temple, the veil was ripped open, right? In Hebrews 4.16, because of what Jesus Christ did by washing away our sins with his blood, we can go boldly to Christ. Hebrews 4.16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of God of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. You and I right now can pray to God personally and ask him for help and we can pray to him and we can praise him and everything. That's amazing. I mean, the Old Testament it had to require the priest to go do this. I've got a reference there, Revelation chapter 22, verse 4. We'll be there in a couple of weeks. But it says, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. We'll be able to see the face of God. That wasn't possible back before that, was it? We know that wasn't possible, but it's going to be possible for you and I. This is going to be absolutely amazing. This is something that we can think about and just be overwhelmed by what God has to offer for us. So remember that. So to be in God's presence, to go to heaven, is there a prerequisite? I always want to make sure that I end my messages by covering this to help us to make sure we truly, truly do understand. So just for a few minutes, let's do some thinking. I'm going to ask you a question, okay? It says in John 6, 47, verily, verily. Now that is the Greek words, amen, amen, where we get the word amen. Uh, sometimes it says, truly, truly, this is Jesus speaking, truly, truly, verily, verily. It really means it is so, it is so. If Jesus says something, it is so, twice, it is so, right? Would you argue with it? And he says, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes, what does believe mean? It means consider that it's true. You believe it's true. On me has everlasting life. How many believe that and how many don't? I mean, seriously, think about this. The question, is there more than one way to interpret this verse? How would somebody screw this verse up? The context agrees with what I just said. Think about it. Look at that verse. Think in your mind. Is there any other way to look at this verse to add to it or to change it? Is there? No. Take God's word for what it says. If you're honest, no, there is no other way to interpret that verse at all. I'm telling you, be careful who you listen to. Many of us have our favorite um, radio pastors or theologians, books that we read, uh, magazines and different and so on, so on, so on. I'm telling you, be careful because we get sucked into this and then we get prideful and we say, I'm not going to deviate away from this because I'm right and you're wrong. That's the way people think sometimes. And I'm telling you, go back and think about this. Look at this. Take this seriously. This is not a game. This is your eternal destiny. Look at 2 Corinthians 2.17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Don't corrupt the word of God by making it say what you want it to say. I mean, sometimes people read John 6.47, they'll gloss over it, they'll pick some other verse and say, well, you've got to do this, this, and this to be saved. No. The Bible tells us, you believe on Jesus Christ, you have what? Ever lasting life. I didn't say it. The Bible says it. So your decision is a matter of eternal life or eternal death. And you choose Christ as your personal Savior, you're going to spend eternity in that place that we just talked about in heaven, which is hard to comprehend. By the way, by the way, this is 
uncomparably more important than who's going to be our next president, right? Some people are so wrapped up in politics and who's going to be the president. Yeah, I, I hope uh, uh, Donald Trump wins the presidency. I'll come right out and say it because I believe he stands for more what we stand for than Kamala Harris, who I think has got some evil tendencies if you were to really look into her. And so the truth is, yes, I'd rather have him win. Is he going to be our savior? Of course not. Always keep your eyes on Christ. You know, if he helps our country or she helps our country or ruins or destroys our country, we got a home in heaven. I look forward to that home. We really do. We're pilgrims here. We'll be here for a short time and then we'll be gone. We'll be gone to heaven. So I hope everyone here today has trusted Christ as Savior. I want to explain this real quick just so you all understand it simply. Let this hand represent you and I, okay? This is Joe, P, Ralph, Fred, uh, Mary, Karen, Amy, whoever. I don't mean to say your names, but I guess I did. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to randomly pick names. But anyways, let's pretend like this is you, okay? And what do you have in common with every other human? The Bible tells me that you have sinned. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. These little spots are sins. Now, mine would have a lot more on there than many of you would, I'm sure. And who knows how many we have hidden sins. We all have sins, right? And you say, well, I could work my way to heaven. I can do something to get rid of these sins. I can cover them up. They're still there. You can cover them up. They're still there. You can try a new leaf. You can flip it over. And it's still flipped upside down leaf. It's still sin. You still have the sin. You can't get rid of it. You can't get rid of the sin at all. So let this here hand represent God Almighty sending his son, Jesus Christ. But first of all, your sin separates you from God, doesn't it? You can't have sin in heaven because if there was sin in heaven, and we're going to learn this in Revelation 21, 27 next week, that it would be a bad place because you would have death. Sin brings, brings death. So your sin separates you from God. But you know what God did for you? He sent his son, Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, For he, God, hath made him, Jesus, to be made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus Christ came down and took your sins upon himself, died, was buried, rose again, the sin payment was done for. And then he says, If you believe that I did that for you, I promise you everlasting life. God's promises everlasting life. Read 1 John chapter 5, verse 10 through 13 again, and really take it for what it says versus what you've heard all your life, maybe in different churches. Here's the truth. Because of Jesus Christ, the cross, you can go to heaven. And that's the truth, because Jesus Christ died for you on the cross, and now he gives you everlasting life. And I hope you all understand it. Know that you, if you don't know it, right now you can just, in the quietness of your mind, Lord, I believe you died on the cross for my sins, and he promises you everlasting life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much today for what you've done, for your love that we can gather together here. Pray, Lord, you'll bless us this afternoon. We pray for our country. Lord, we pray for this election on Tuesday. Lord, we pray for Israel. And we pray for everything that's going on in the world, Lord, that you would just continually, continually help us as Christians, as pilgrims in this world, just to be faithful and serving you and loving you and getting the gospel message out to everyone as we possibly can. We pray all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. So our final song is when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Amen. Amen.